Hi, welcome to History Respond. I'm your host, Bob Whitaker. On today's episode, we'll be considering Warsaw, developed by Pixelated Milk. Warsaw is a turn-based tactical RBG that is set during the Warsaw Uprising of 1944. Players take control of a small group of civilians and soldiers as they attempt to overthrow the city's German occupation forces. With me on today's show to talk about this game and its setting is Alina Nabavelska. Alina is a historical research assistant who graduated from Birkbeck University with an MA in European history. Her dissertation was on the survival of the first mass transport into Auschwitz. Alina is currently writing a book on the first mass transport of Polish political prisoners into Auschwitz and is also a tour guide in Poland. Alina, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So Lena, I am going to jump us into a new game of Warsaw. You can see here up at the top that I completed a run through. This is 2nd October 1944. Uh, so I have played through the game, but I thought it'd be useful if we started a new game so that you could see the introductory video and perhaps uh, give me some comments on that. Perfect, go for it. So we'll go through the tutorial that gives us the video. I've noticed that if we did the advanced campaign, it, it jumps us right into the second day of the uprising, which is not useful for us. And because I'm a wuss, I'm going to put this on easy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. There's little hope for release. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry. I'm wondering if that's a translation issue. Yeah, I think that's a translation issue. So this uh, number of people living within the uprising area, this is an uh, important number historically, but then also uh, for the game, uh, one of the ways the game tracks your progress is based on how many civilians are still in the uprising zone. Okay. So that number will go down as you go through the uprising. Um, so one of the things that struck me about that introduction was the fact that it didn't necessarily say uh, who was opposing the Nazis. It was some mention of the Soviet army, but uh, it says the Nazis were opposed on two fronts <laughs> and if you were to go just on the game you wouldn't really know who was opposing the nazis on the outside and i think that points to one of the issues that i was hoping you could help us with with this game was providing us a bit of a historical context because um, the game is a lot of fun uh, it does a lot of great things with the map of warsaw uh, but it doesn't really help the player understand what's going on outside of the uprising yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, obviously, historically, in a game like this, I can't, I can tell you the context, but they can't go far back as people are going to get bored. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm going to tell you about the context, I can do you, I'm going to give you as quickly and as briefly as we can with this, because otherwise we could be up to do a whole podcast on just this very topic. <laughs> so if we're going to do this, we're going to go back to the invasion, because obviously, if you know history, Poland was invaded on the 1st of September 1939. Terror and oppression are instant. I mean, literally, it happens so fast. Um, Einsatzgruppen, for people who know what Einsatzgruppen was, it was a, a, a unit that most people don't realize that it actually, they actually entered Poland um, during the invasion, um, but they did, that's where they started. These guys were basically told to shoot all Poles that were offering resistance. And if people who are listening were really interested in this, there is um, an incredible photograph, you just need to go online and Google Bydgoszcz. Okay, and you come up with this photograph of uh, prisoners, what were prisoners, people being executed in the middle of the street, and you just need to look at the face of the man closest to you, and then pretty much that will explain to you the fear and how actually how horrible it really was. I mean, there was twenty thousand people that were executed within the first two months of occupation. This is but twenty thousand people. That's just insane. I mean, they wanted to suppress the polls. The Polish intelligentsia 
it came up with Action B, which was a whole new thing to suppress Poles. There were mass arrests, people were shot. Um, if you go to Warsaw, you can go to a cemetery in the Palmyra Forest. And wow, okay, what's going on here? <laughs> so, sorry, going back to going back to this, in Palmyra Forest, you can go and visit some of the places where there were mass graves where people were literally just being executed mm. just for, for doing, you know, being, you know, a doctor or being um, a, a university lecturer or opposing the Nazi regime. You know, Hitler basically said, You've got to, we've got to exterminate these people. Mm -hmm. Intel against you, go and wipe them out. So then we're talking about the occupation. We're talking about, again, like I said, mass arrests, people are being sent. And we, we'll talk about... Um, Warsaw in this context, I mean, because this was around the whole of Poland, mm -hmm. but we'll talk about Warsaw in this specific context because it all comes obviously down to the Warsaw Uprising. So like you said, mass arrest, they're being sent to Pavia prison, which was in the middle of the ghetto, funnily enough. Um, Alea Shulka as well, which is the Gestapo headquarters, you did not want to end up there because you were most likely going to be tortured mm. for some sort of information. People are disappearing. People aren't coming back from the war. This is, you know, your uncle, your brother, your neighbor. Um, Jews are being sent into the ghetto. The ghetto is being formed in 1940. Mm -hmm. People, they're being, these, the people are being exterminated. Um, a policing hour is brought in. So if you're not back by policing hour, they can arrest you. I've got a really good anecdote for this. My grandmother actually has a photograph of a friend of hers that I got really attached to one day and I asked if the story was behind it. She said, oh, it's my friend. And um, basically, he was working outside of Warsaw. He came back on the train. The train was delayed. It was after policing hour. It was dark. It was snowing. There was snow on the ground. He walked home. And obviously, a German patrol followed him, knocked on the door. He's broken, basically, curfew. So they shot him on the front doorstep. Mm. So we're looking at horrific oppression you know got people are being deported from their homes they're being sent to german labor camps resettlement camps set concentration camps um most famous one will be the zamost region, region in the eastern part of poland um 116,000 people were expelled including children women german children uh, german sorry uh, polish children have been germanized at this point we're closing schools universities they're de destroying polish culture mm -hmm. so you understand this whole idea of the uprising you have to understand this context right. of oppression. Yeah, you could see why the people would be willing to take up arms against these exactly. occupiers. Exactly. So I always say because there's a lot of there's a lot of conflict about people talking about why the uprising came up. You know, some people say it was a really bad thing, but for me, you know, if you truly put yourself into that position and try and imagine what life was um, under occupation, I and mean, people are being rounded up in the street, I and mean, you could be out, for example for, uh, I don't know, a walk, or you've gone to the shops and you're coming home and suddenly there's chaos because what they've come, the Germans have come, one side of the street and the other side of the street, blocked it off, everybody in the middle gets put into prison, set to concentration camps, labor camps, wherever, wherever they choose to. Mm -hmm. So leaving your house at the end of the day, you don't know if you're going to be coming home. Yeah. So, so in that context, you feel like you don't have anything to lose by taking up arms exactly absolutely exactly i'm just also watching the game while you're doing this and i'm kind of kind of watching this a little bit well so yeah let me explain this a bit so it's a it's a turn-based rpg game so the rpg role-playing elements are kind of um, spread across uh the whole game but the turn-based elements you see here where uh, we've got our group of uh, resistance fighters uh, we've got a nurse uh, we've got a home army officer or sharpshooter i should say uh, and then we have got a kind of a uh, the, it's a character we they call the scoundrel uh, but he's essentially a, a local insurgent uh, who helps to run the black market in warsaw i like this guy, I like this guy <laughs> he's because... got a he's got a great look and i'd say one of the best parts of this game besides the the gameplay which is a lot of fun uh is the artwork uh the character artwork and he, he, you know, you can look at him and you feel like you've, you've got a whole personality, a whole backstory there. Do you know, um, you're looking at him and he's, he, he would have probably been in the uprising. I mean, a lot of uprising insurgents didn't necessarily wear military uniforms because mm -hmm. they weren't. Mm -hmm. 
Um, these these were people that had literally just walked out of you know walked out of the house, mm-hmm. and a lot of women were in what they ended up in. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the important things about this game is it it comes out of this uh, genre of games, um, turn based RPGs. Uh, kind of the most famous one that came out a few years ago is called Darkest Dungeon. Uh, but the primary basis for this game, there's some variations between these types of games. The primary basis of it is that it, they're incredibly difficult and that it has the idea of permadeath. So the death, when you lose a character in a battle, you don't get them back afterwards. They're, they're dead. Right. They're gone for good. And so one of the reasons why I think this game works uh, is partly uh, based on the mechanics of the game, also in this particular setting. So this setting... The Warsaw Uprising, it you know, it has the feeling, as you've illustrated for us, this feeling of hopelessness, this feeling like, well, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, and that mm. fits in well with the mechanics of the game because it's very punishing, it's very difficult, and it's kind of leading you in with the assumption not everybody is going to make it out of this game alive, despite how well you might play. Well, once I tell you the statistics of death. Yeah, that, <laughs> it is. It is incredible. I'm actually curious because I'm looking at the map now. Oh sure. Um, obviously, I'd um, I'd have to check the original. Uh, what, what's it called in English? Gosh, my my English language has gone out of the window since I've moved to Poland. <laughs> um, we might as well laugh at it because I do all the time. I wonder if they use the original plans because obviously Warsaw changed. Mm. after the war and we'll talk about that a little bit later why it changed yeah we'll see uh let's get back to the 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 hideout and we'll see a larger map of the the city and the districts and so maybe you can you can take a look at that and see if there's anything there that's useful uh so this is the kind of uh, daily summation page you see we're on the first day of the uprising Mm. um and then we've got the various districts of warsaw here and in each of these districts, we have uh, a, a red bar denoting the morale uh, for that district. So if a city's, uh, city district's morale goes down to zero, then that district surrenders. And that means that you lose the supplies and ammunition that you get from that district. So the kind of metagame for uh, the RPG elements is attempting to maintain uh, these districts and their morale so that you have enough uh, supplies in order to go out and do missions mm-hmm. around the city. Can we can we pick anyone? Uh, pick any one of these districts? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so let me get to the, I'll get to the screen where you can see that. And so for each uh, day, you usually end up with an event um, that you have to... Um, play through and it usually ends up either increasing your um, district morale or perhaps leading to uh, supplies but it can also subtract uh, from your morale and your from your supplies but the thing about these uh, events is that it does give you a little bit of context into what's going on outside of your playthrough with the uprising um, so here you've got a mention of a, a Nazi outpost uh, and there's enthusiastic sentiment to try to gain traction and use the resistance fighters to go after that. But of course, I mean, um, making this decision comes along with risks. Uh, that it means okay. this could go very poorly for us if we make the wrong decision. So we could say, yes, go ahead and let the clergyman lead this assault or say no uh, please go away so what would you what would you suggest I well mean, i'm i'm gonna leave it up to you you're the guest oh so gosh, i don't know um <laughs> because the thing is there's uh, there was a lot of clergymen that were involved in the uprising i don't mean directly in fighting mm-hmm. um these guys were holding mass they were helping morale uh cooking um all sorts of various different things they even you know they even um did marriages mm. So I don't know what English, or lost the English word now for what it means to uh, officiate, that's the word. Yes. They officiated marriages in the middle of the uprising. These guys were absolutely incredible. Um, to be honest, I don't know if I should trust, I, I'm not going to trust the clergyman because he's not, unless he's been trained as a soldier. See, I need a bit more context here. Was he trained as a soldier? <laughs> let's, let's dismiss him for now. Okay, so dismiss the clergyman. I feel really bad for doing Pointless that. Pointless to wait slives, right? Based yeah. on revelations, yeah. 
Okay, well, so we didn't get any negative effects. If something bad had happened with that, then it would have come up here. So I think that was probably the right decision. I'm glad, I'm glad. I'm Good glad work, good work. <laughs> All right, so that finishes the first day, and now we start day two. And you can see here, this is the number of civilians in the city. So I'm kind of a little bit surprised because what I would have done, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a games person, as in, in the sense of games creator, but I think what I would have done for the first one, I mean, which is really important what they did in the first day, was to gain strategic points. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was that was the original point of the mission, mm -hmm. was to gain, you know, for example, um, the... Um, Again, my English language has gone completely out the window. That's um, fine. <laughs> power plant, that's the word I was looking for. So, for example, in Bovisha, they gained the power plant, you know, so they had power to the whole whole, whole city, they could control that. Mm. Um, and that was probably one of the most important things to do, is to gain these points, and that kind of doesn't say this. Yeah, um, and I think that's one of the more disappointing parts of the game, is it's missing that kind of... Uh, context yeah. and I think in some ways that historical context could actually help the player further immerse themselves in the game world. Um, yeah, and to maybe um, become a little bit more attached to the, to the people because yeah. there was a yeah. there was a very high death rate in the first first few days. I mean, we're talking about insurgents, we're not talking about civilians. That's a whole different other topic. Mm -hmm. And you know, people, so many people were dying. For, in the in the first few days that i think i would be feel a bit more attached to the game than if i had something like that so you can see here this is the uh hideout the safe house uh and this is where your characters uh heal up and restock before they go out on missions uh, you can see here the uh, the emblem of the resistance or the home army i'm not sure but uh this is what gives so. you your, <laughs> this is what gives so, you your um uh your missions and to get over a city overview so it's the, it's Kotwica in Polish, or the Anchor in English, and it was actually created as, as a competition. And the woman who actually created, there's a little tidbit for you, the woman who created it actually ended up in Auschwitz, and she died that with mm. her mother, her sister, and her sister-in-law. Mm -hmm. So, um, wow. yeah, it's quite a sad story. If you, if you ever do decide to go to Auschwitz, uh, I think it's in block five, you can see all the photos. Um, and you can be able to see her photo, ask the tour guide, they'll be able to show you her photo on the wall. Mm. It's quite sad, it's quite a mm. sad story. Um, so, so see here we've got uh, the different districts of the city and then once we go in and pick a mission, uh, it will uh, kind of zoom in on that territory. So I'll wait to do that until we're ready. Uh, to go. I was going to say, can I pick one? Can I can I be the one to pick? The, absolutely, yeah. You, 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 you're the guest, <laughs> so you get first choice. Um, I thought before we would leave, we would kind of click on some of these uh, characters. We can click on our scoundrel friend here, and he, see here you've got all of these um, RPG elements, uh, attributes mm. that you can change, uh, weapons that you can change, um, and unfortunately, it doesn't give us a, a backstory for this character here, but you can go over to this uh, bookish looking friend here, uh, the archive. Uh, he's got a codex, and that includes information about the various characters in oh, the game. Wow. So here's the paramedic. Uh, here is a sharpshooter that you get later on. This is the current uh, home army soldier that we've got, and I thought we would focus in on our friend the scoundrel and it gives us a little bit of a background on him oh, I do like that so born and raised in Warsaw illicit exchanges foreign currencies I like that other notes absurdly smug about his terrible drawing skills <laughs> and then dislike <laughs> children as well um, <laughs> Um, and then it gives us kind of more uh, role-playing game uh, attributes. Um, but each one of these characters has a personal quest that unfortunately comes later on in the game. We won't have time to go into those yet. But it, those uh, personal quests give us a little bit more of uh, personality and backstory uh, to each of these characters. But I, I mean, I don't know what you think, but I, I kind of wish this material was kind of front and center for the characters rather than yeah. kind of stowed away in this back corner of the the hideout with the codex i'd say i don't think i'd be that smart to figure it out that it's where it is at the moment mm -hmm. like you said if you clicked on the character and it was there you could see 
strange. Do you know what else? I'd like a bit more, a few more photos, not photos necessarily, but like pictures of him with his mum or, you know, <laughs> yep. something, yep. something very personal because, you know, we should be, we should get attached to these people. It makes mm -hmm. it much more personal. Mm -hmm. Dislikes those who questions orders. Um, then no, let's that's see. not a good thing. The paramedic. Uh, rain and cold weather. <laughs> Doesn't everybody hate cold weather? Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> but so there you've got so it's a little bit of uh, historical uh, context that's baked into these character bios. But like I said, it's unfortunately. Uh, I wonder if they used um, if they used real people or just made it up. I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to know, investigate that. We can go through. These are some of the other characters that we unlock uh, through the course of the game. And I've got them because uh, I've played through the game. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you have to keep them in your uh, party for five missions in order to gain more information about them. And I haven't done that yet. But uh, we've got a home army officer. Uh, we've got uh, a rifleman, a telephone operator. Um, let's see what other characters we have. Uh, Polish cavalryman. Uh, he's got a lot yeah. of personality. Um, and, and I want to say, I thought there was another one that was worthwhile. I can't find it now. But then you also get Ooh. a lot of technical Did information. Did you go down? Was it down or up, I think? A little bit more. I think it was. Stop, stop. Uh, no, a little bit more. You came across something quite naughty. I can't see what it was. Maybe by the Gestapo. Oh, there we go. Dervlanger soldier. Oh, that is... Yeah, these, no, do you know what? I'm disappointed in this. Mm. They should have expanded on this. This, these men were, I cannot explain to you the brutality. And these men went around raping and killing in the most brutal ways. I mean, they were, uh, oh, just, if anybody's, re I'm not going to, I'm not going to bring it down on this, but please go and read about this unit. He is, mm. He is horrific. I mean, they participated in the murder of, of Polish, like thousands of Polish citizens, innocent children, women, mm. pregnant women. Mm. The innocent. Yeah. yeah they, I'm, in, I'm a little bit shocked that that's in there. Well, the description we've got here leaves a lot to the imagination. We've got a mention of uh, infamously brutal, but that's it. Um, so, again, it's another moment in this game where... I feel like it could have gone into a little bit more detail, but perhaps, uh, as you were saying, with this uh, soldier, this unit in particular, maybe that kind of detail would have been too much uh, for this type of game. But um, I don't know. Yeah. It's hard to judge. I feel like it, it is also a game, of course, where you are participating in the murder of soldiers. So um, it seems like that kind of historical background, that kind of information could be included uh, in that sort of context. Um, but... You've got uh, little descriptions here for German soldiers that you come across. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in addition, you've also got descriptions for the arms and uh, armaments that you use through the course of the Ooh, game. Can we go down them a little bit more? Sure. Just, just to have a, just to have a, a gander. Oh, a piet. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That's, uh, that's funnily enough, uh, that, that's not funny actually, that's not funny at all. I <laughs> think actually ended up uh, killing my grandfather's platoon oh, leader. No. Oh no. Yeah, he misfired it actually, and it ricocheted off the, uh, off the, the window and uh, yeah, basically exploded. Mm. Um, but so it's, uh, it's a game that has got historical- Oh, gun. There we go, my yeah. grandfather used one of those. It's got historical context in drips and draps. Um, but you have to yeah. go and look for it, and it doesn't necessarily put it front and center. Um, the focus of this game is really on the mechanics and on the gameplay, uh, rather I than like on that. the history. It's rare to see a brand within the ranks of the uprising. Mm -hmm. Yes and no. I really shouldn't play this game. I probably worked that apart historically. <laughs> So let's uh, let's jump into one of the missions. I don't think there's anything else to look at here. There's uh, our arsenal. This allows us to barter for other goods, uh, ammunition, weapons, etc. Isn't that a bit sexist having a woman though? Mm, yeah, I think yeah, you're right. It is. 
Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. It was it was quite you know women had their roles, but they also had some incredibly dangerous roles. Mm -hmm. And then we've got officers here for recruiting. Uh, we can recruit another soldier if we need it. I don't think we need it right now. Uh, and then of course a medic uh, that helps with uh, injuries. Uh, and then our playable characters, these three right here uh, that uh, are seen relaxing, I suppose. Um, as much as you could relax. Um, as much as you could <laughs> relax. And so uh, I th one of the questions I had for you that uh, we haven't quite gone into yet was, you know, who were the type of people that participated in the uprising? Because we've got a home army officer, we've got a medic, and then we've got a scoundrel. And I think it's an interesting mix of personalities and characters. But I'm wondering, you know, does the this you know mix that you see in the game, does this reflect reality? Was it a mixture in the uprising of soldiers and civilians? Oh, completely, completely. I mean, for example, I'm gonna use my grandfather as an example. Uh, he, along with many others, were training for this for, for years, absolute years. I mean, he started his training in 1940 and um, worked in the in the underground resistance at the time, along with, like I said, hundreds of others. There were so many cells that were up at the time. And when it came down to the uprising, they were also operational as actual soldiers. Mm. You had uh, women, and women in that time were training to be nurses uh, all, through the, all through the occupation. They um, became liaison officers, these women. They, some of them did the most dangerous things. I mean, they would lead soldiers, civilians, and people through the tunnels. They were tunnel guides. And what would happen in these tunnels is the Germans were throwing grenades. They, um, uh, anything with fire, they loved to burn petrol. They burned petrol. I mean, so many of these women perished mm. doing this sort of job. And the worst thing about it, you had children. Mm. There were actual children. I mean, the majority of them didn't didn't fire a weapon, but they were. Uh, they had the postal service. They ran the postal service. These children, they uh, were liaison officers. They helped with the cooking. They helped with feeding the the soldiers. Everybody, everybody was involved. I mean, there was a lot of civilians that didn't get themselves involved. Some some joined in on a whim. You know, oh, I'm just going to fight for my country. Look, there's the uprising. I'm going to join and they they fought everybody everybody fought and everybody gave something somehow somewhere somehow um so yeah it's pretty correct there was a massive massive mixture of people mm, great well as you see here this is the mission select screen and we've got the districts of the city lit Ooh, up here and uh these uh, districts the first one. <laughs> are yeah thanks <laughs> these districts some of them uh don't always have a mission uh, so, for yeah. instance, this one doesn't. Um, but uh, oh, for the, the ones that have got uh, a mission, uh, it gives you uh, the mission details, uh, the risk involved, and then the potential rewards uh, that come along with that. And, of course, with each one of these, we've got to keep in mind this morale number so that if uh, mm. we were to do a mission in this district, then the morale would either stay up or uh, go even higher. Uh, but if we were to ignore a mission in another district, then their morale and their supplies would go down. So you oh, kind of have to do this awkward balancing act where you're attempting to maintain as many districts as you can in order to increase your supplies, increase your ammunition. Uh, mm. But then you've got it later on in the game, too many missions to do, and you've got to make strategic choices as to which of these districts is... Uh, save uh, you could be saved or uh, which of these districts is most valuable to you so it really puts uh, a difficult uh, onus on the player uh, to make some tough tough decisions well that uh, I'd say that's that's the thing that have to be up with some of the most horrible and tough decisions that you'd have to make mm -hmm. yeah and I'm assuming I you know of course I don't know Warsaw very well but I'm assuming these uh, images here correlate to uh, major uh, landmarks in the city. I don't know if you can yes. back me up yes. on that. Um, so basically, if you look, there's a river down the middle. And I mean, I'm assuming a lot of your listeners know what London looks like. It looks mm -hmm. like you've got your north, your south, and a river in the middle. Well, I describe Warsaw as in the opposite. You've got a west and an east bank and a river in the middle, basically. Mm -hmm. That's how I describe the, the side of Warsaw. Yeah, so uh, we have got missions. I think there's three of them. Let's see. 
at six. Let's do Walla. Let's do that three, one. Three and two. So you want to do three, Walla? Okay. Yeah. Well, you actually clicked on Jolly Bush, but funny enough, I'm going to give you a really quick tidbit. So um, the Warsaw Uprising actually started um, at our double, so five o'clock on the 1st of um, August, but there was some ruckus that actually happened in Jolly Bush, funnily enough, um, at about one o'clock the same day, where, uh, uh, I keep saying prisoners, I'm stuck in Auschwitz at the moment, um, where insurgents were moving guns from one place to another, preparing for the uprising, and they basically got stopped by a German unit, and they refused to stop, and there was a whole bit, load of fighting up there uh, before our double at five o'clock. Mm, interesting. So everyone was on edge at the time. And for the past few days before that, everybody was on edge. They were all like, when are we going to stop fighting? Like they were, they were, these young people at edge and they wanted to go. Mm-hmm. They wanted to fight. So why did they pick, and I'll, I'll jump us into a mission here, but why did they pick the 1st of August? What was the significance of that date? Was it something to do with the progress of the Red Army? Was it simply yeah, that was so the, the preparation that they made was 1st of August beforehand and it was independent of outside forces? What was what was the decision? Uh, why it was why like it August was, 1st? Um, there's a lot of factors, and obviously I'm not going to talk for the whole time because I'm going to bore people, but <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things that happen around that time. So uh, the, the Soviet Union, the Red Army is approaching. Mm-hmm. So, of course, you know, they wanted to be liberated already. And because the problem is, is the Soviet Union comes in, they could enforce, you know, the communist regime there. And that was what Poland was afraid of. Mm-hmm. And that was a big danger of, of, of this. And unfortunately, it does happen in the end. I mean, Poland goes under communist rule, but this is what they were trying to stop. So if they could be free, they could establish their own government, they could have their strategic points, they could be like, you know, now you can come into our free city. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. Soviet Union starts broadcasting things about the 25th of uh, July. They're like, yeah, come on, rise up, rise up against your, you know, German mm-hmm. oppressors, do it. The Poles are like, yes, we're going to do this. Um, so they're coming along and they stop. Basically, they stop and they watch Warsaw burn at the mm. end of the day. Uh, the funny thing is, is what they were trying to emulate is what happened in Lvov, which happened a few days before that, where the Soviet army was approaching, Lvov did, had an uprising, it was successful, the Germans left, and basically they had their city back. And this is what they wanted, but, you know, it, it, that's not how it worked. It's been 63 days of fighting compared to a handful, because about four or five days they were fighting, maybe not even that many in Lvov. Um, and then you had, uh, oh, God, gosh, I can't remember the date exactly, but literally a few days before, the governor of Warsaw said, you know, we need to fortify against the Red Army, and they wanted 100,000 uh, young men to do this. And basically, everybody just ignored the command and just went, no, we're not going to do this. And they were also afraid of reprisals. So there was there was so many different factors at this time that were happening that that's what the decision ended up because it was supposed to end up being on the 31st of july and then they postponed it mm-hmm. you know there's looking at it from a historical perspective now we could turn around and say yeah well they could have waited longer or they could have done it earlier or they could have and it might not have lasted this long maybe might could have possibly right words that are just completely and utterly useless it happened so these guys wanted to do it they needed i mean my grandfather quotes in his in his uh, in his diary that the moment he shot at a German at a German, he was getting back for all of basically. I'm going to be really sweary a little bit. I don't mean to swear, but all the shit mm-hmm. that they had to endure during the occupation. I mean, this is what he was he was getting back at them for all of this. Mm-hmm. And it had been going on since 1939, so years and yeah. years and years. Five that. years. Yeah. Five years of occupation. I just want I want your listeners to understand and to, to if you if you didn't listen at the beginning what I said, go back and listen. <laughs> um, about about what the occupation was like, I mean the brutality of it all. So you, you guys have got to remember we lost six million citizens and three million of them were, were Jews. Mm-hmm. So six million out of gosh, that's about half of the population of, of, of now of mm-hmm. London. Mm-hmm. I think about the same half the population of New York City, I think, as well. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken. It's it's difficult to comprehend. Let's see. So uh, we talked a little bit about the um, kind of lack of support 
that the uprising received from Russia, from the Soviet army. I'm wondering, uh, did the resistance in the city, did it receive any support from other allies, from the British, from the Americans, any supply drops, anything of that nature? Yes, they did. Um, and I mean, about th- unfortunately, about 30% of these drops that they did. So the British, the Polish and the Americans all were doing Allied drops. Now, you've got to remember, if we're looking at Poland, we've got 1st of August 1944. Go to the east of the Western Front, apologies. I mean, what's happening there at that time? They're battling their way through France, mm-hmm. uh, Belgium, Normandy, and it, to be fair, all their supplies were concentrated there. They couldn't afford to be losing so many planes. Planes were being shot out of the sky while doing airdrops. Mm-hmm. They couldn't land in Russian airfields, so they had to go into the south, into Italy. So they were flying from Italy. Um, there were quite, I can't remember the statistic of how many how many pilots actually lost their lives. But if anybody's ever in Poland and you're in Krakow, if you go to, uh, just need to double check two seconds, the name of the, the cemetery, which is uh, Rakowicki Cemetery in uh, Krakow, you can go and see all the allies who lost their lives trying to help mm. Oz. So it was, um, it was quite tragic at the end, actually. Mm-hmm. But the airdrops actually started from the 3rd and the 4th of August. So we're going pretty early, within three days of the uprising, they were already dropping. Oh, wow, like that's I said, incredible. There's, there's only only 30 percent got into the into German hands, right. so they did they did lose quite a lot of mm. supplies. I mean, these guys, you've got to remember, these men and women and children went into battle with, I think, it was one out of ten of them were armed. Mm-hmm. Wow, it's insane. So what? I mean, if they weren't armed, what kind of activities did they participate in? Were they simply? Um, kind of helping to support the people who were armed were they running supplies what what was the what was the kind of daily activity during the uprising for civilians and others who weren't uh, actually armed with weapons I think you pretty much summed it up there for me oh, great <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so basically especially women there were very few women that were armed and they would be runners they would run information so everybody had a communication. Uh, children, like I said earlier, they were running posts from civilians to soldiers. Um, and communication was key because you needed to know what was happening, where, why, and how. And you needed to get orders across the city. Mm-hmm. So these women, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I can't remember which, there's a major street. And I'm, I can tell you right now, my friend is probably listening, going, why can't you remember the name of the street? Where... <clears throat> Women were literally, they couldn't get across it at all because German German uh, sharpshooters were sitting there and just getting rid of them one after the other mm. really quick. So they were, they were, they were dying. It was, it was a bloodbath. So we come across here and uh, we've got uh, heavy patrols uh, in this area of the district. And um, we've only got so many terms. You see this number down here, action points. Mm. We've only got so many action points with which to complete our mission before it ends automatically. Oh, um, really? Yes. And so uh, it does put uh, kind of an onus on the player to try to get into a district, get the mission finished, and then move on rather than Ooh. kind of sticking around trying to take out all of these um all these enemies because it's just too much work uh it's there's only so much that this small band of resistance fighters can do but you do come across uh supplies enemy stockpiles that you can loot and uh, well they did that is exactly what they did that is exactly what they did um if it's uh uh, zoshka who took it over actually they found a store storage with um uniforms and you know coats and things like that and they managed to stockpile on those during the uprising so if you ever look at battalion zoshka for example and you see the german panzer you know the patterns Mm -hmm. that's where they looted them from so as you notice this game is uh very deliberate (laughs) in its pacing the uh, turn-based combat can be very slow going. 
um, as you're going through. But, um, you know, it is, even though it is kind of slow paced, it is very intense because you're always constantly looking at all these numbers for your, um, your player characters. You're looking at the enemy's numbers uh, and you're trying to basically choose from a lot of bad options rather than having um, the kind of the freedom uh, that and power fantasy that you get from a lot of other games. Mm. Um, and so, again, I think from a developer standpoint, it, it kind of makes sense to have this type of game mechanic put in this setting because it, it was already a desperate situation and it I think you know from their perspective uh, it, it's a it's a perfect marriage of uh, mechanics with a setting uh, a setting that makes sense for those mechanics I find the music's quite intense as well <laughs> it is yes it, um, foreboding is how I would I would phrase it. <laughs> I'm just. Um, I'm also looking at the top of your screen with the Polish eagles. Quite mm -hmm. interesting. The, um, the the health that's slowly going down versus the the, the German eagle. There we go. Okay, so we've got one soldier left, and you can see here we've got little uh, obstacle sandbags and then barricades that are built up. You can have your player character hide behind those. Uh, it gives them oh. a little bit of a defensive bonus. Um, plus, it gives you something else to look at uh, instead of uh, just the, the drab colors of the German soldiers. <clears throat> I mean, there were so many barricades built up everywhere, mm -hmm. all over Warsaw. It was, it was a city of barricades, basically. Let's see. Let's use our medic. There we go. Good shot. I've got to emphasize how heroic some of these women were. They were just incredible. Well, there's plenty of uh, women characters in the game. There's um, the medic, but then there's also sharpshooters. Uh, there's the um, uh, telephone operator. Uh, and she's a really useful character as well. So I think that... Um, you know, you uh, you mentioned <laughs> it's a little little sexist to have the um, the woman manning the kind of uh, supplies and whatnot, but there are uh, diverse roles I think within the um, resistance group when you go out on mm -hmm. missions. There's diverse roles for women, and plenty of opportunities for them to uh, participate not just in support, like being a medic, but then also to uh, participate in the actual fighting, which you know as you've mentioned before they were often called upon uh, to do in this context. Okay. So I thought maybe we would just go through and try to finish this mission and then maybe we could call it an episode. So let's see. So this is a moment where uh, we've got our mission objective here uh, in this zone. And uh, typically when we see an image like this, it has something to do with either local resistance fighters or civilians who are looking for help uh, from the resistance. Oh, that's interesting. Surrounded by movie posters, okay. So I think this is our um, scoundrel character. Mm. So huh. I suppose he's obsessed with movies, but uh, we get a uh, experience boost, which we can use on our attributes to increase our abilities and whatnot. So a uh, worthwhile mission and this is finished. So we could uh, continue fighting. We can go and pick up these supplies, but again, you have to weigh that with how many action points you have left. And then also the potential risk uh, to your characters. If you keep running into patrols mm. uh, and because permadeath is on, um, you know, 
you could be uh, greedily going after more supplies, more experience, but then at the same time putting your characters at risk and perhaps losing them, which would be really bad uh, in this situation. So I'm going to quit. The scoundrel's not doing very well, is he? No, exactly. And so these are injuries that take time to heal. And so essentially, if you've got two or more, you need to sit out the next mission. So let's go back to the hideout. And then here we've got another event that we'll play through before uh, the end of this day, or actually the start of the sixth day. So it jumps ahead a little bit, as you notice, plus four days. Mm -hmm. And that uh, is based on how long your missions take in each of the uh, different combat zones in each of the districts. I love that. One of the, oh, here we go. So here you go. One of the gray rank runners, I can actually talk about this. So that's, um, it's the scouting basically. So the young mm -hmm. boy there, he's, uh, you can see he's holding letters and are saying that they would uh, take care of the post and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that is a prime example there for you. Well, and he's uh, joined our cause, which means that he'll be a playable character. We'll have to go and see if he's got any backstory. That's, uh, that's such a young, you know, that's what you'd call a young boy. It's sort of Frank and be Flamek. I think that's very sweet. And there he is. With a toy train set. Very there cute. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad though that they emphasize uh, the role of children in this as well, because it's quite important. Well, and this is new for me. I In my first playthrough, I didn't come across this character, so this is great. I'm, this is a happy coincidence. And so he's got some uh, abilities, bandaging, and then a Molotov cocktail as well, which seems perfectly safe for, uh, for a, young a boy. child. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and let's see, let's check the codex. And again, this is something, you know, when you click on this character, you don't necessarily get their backstory here, but you can't go into the codex and see if they've got anything listed. Oh, there you go. Perfect. And then we would have to play with him on five missions, which unfortunately we won't have time for. But uh, mm. I do like the little touches of characterization. We've got likes, firecrackers, and dislikes heights. So that's that sounds accurate. I've just realized they've put nicknames in there um, mm -hmm. as their pseudonyms. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that, you know, if you should use the word nickname or pseudonym, but it depends on really if people understand what the word pseudonym means. Mm hmm. I think nicknames, that makes sense, right? I mean, in this context, I think I think it does. Yeah. But then again, the historian of me is going, no, it's pseudonyms. <laughs> I see. Um, yeah, and so all of it, it looks like all of the characters have that. Yeah. Because yeah. that's what they were known. I mean, there's um, there's a lot of people that were just known by their pseudonyms and nobody knew what their real name was. None. No, no, God. <laughs> but the sad thing is, is when you walk through some of the cemeteries, you, you see a pseudonym, but mm -hmm. you won't see a name. So oh, this person doesn't really have a name. It has a, you know, they have a pseudonym and that's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Dislikes irresponsibility. <laughs> uh, so before we wrap up, I'm going to jump us out of this section of the game. Let's see if I can hit escape here. Well, that's just going to give me zoom controls. Let's go back to the main menu. <clears throat> and let's jump into this part of the game. Let me get the zoom controls back up here and get rid of this. You know what? There's people standing there right now. Mm -hmm. A little bit of a communist sort of vibe. Certainly this fellow right it. here. Yeah. 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 I'm not liking it very much. Mm -hmm. If we're going to be honest, then that is the vibe I'm getting right now. Mm -hmm. And so let's jump into the late game here. This is a save that I had uh, for the last day.
So then this gives us a um, postscript on our characters mm -hmm. that I played through with in the, um, the first playthrough that I had. Oh, that's interesting. They brought that up, the cursed soldiers. Mm -hmm. It's true. I mean, that was an incredible movement, though. So this is the cavalry officer. Oh. And this is the home army officer. Received guests from the new government's Department of Security. It was never seen again. Yeah, that is, um, that is, if anybody's interested, that is a horrific story. A lot of these men and women disappeared because of the communist regime. Mm -hmm. Here's our scoundrel, the movie lover. <laughs> Sent to prison for handling and procuring counterfeit passports. This is our telephone operator. And so that's the end of the game. I don't know if there was anything that you saw in there that was curious no, or interesting. It was very interesting uh, mentioning about the communist regime. It kind of leaves a little bit of a, because it's, it's a subject that's not really been uh, researched up until now, especially in the Western world. Uh, there's, there's no literature from what I know uh, about what happened in Poland. And it's very, very, but, but not even spoken about. Um, I did a podcast about the E Day and talking about Poland, uh, what happened in Poland during the E Day. Mm -hmm. um, it was hell. I mean, they were basically one occupier for another. Uh, so many people disappeared. So many people ended up in prison, executed, um, or they ended up in prison and were brutally, so brutally interrogated that they were they were scarred for the rest of their lives. Um, Especially in Warsaw, there was a notorious prison in Warsaw, and it's act they're actually opening it up into a, into a museum. I think in 2022, it was in Rakowiecka, if uh, anybody wants to Google that, or simply Mokotov Prison. Um, that's where they executed Pilecki, if anybody knows Pilecki's backstory. Um, do, do have a look at him, he's a very interesting character. Um, but yeah, it was... Uh, it was a hard and horrible time for mm. Poland. And it seems in some ways they, the Polish traded one occupying force for another yeah, with that the was Soviet it. army. And uh, the Soviets came to, to liberate Poland apparently, but they didn't, they ended up staying and uh, it was not a good time. I mean, they, it took them, what was it, about three months to enter Warsaw after the uprising. Mm -hmm. They entered in January, 17th of January, 1945. They sat and they waited till it burned to the ground. Mm. Yeah. I mean, um, I think, um, you know, I feel like I've uh, spent most of this episode <laughs> criticizing the lack of historical context in this game. But I would say this game has gotten a pretty good reception in uh, Western Europe and in um, North America with amongst players. And I think it, it's worthwhile, you know, like you said, there's very few. Um, secondary sources on this type of history in the Western world. So I think it's really useful to have any sort of history 
Uh, yes, no matter how circumspect it is, it's better to have some sort of history about this for Western audiences and for them to be aware of the Warsaw Uprising as a historical event rather than have nothing at all. Um, I can say for myself uh, as a historian of Britain and North America that this was really a worthwhile game mechanically, but then also uh, useful for me to learn more about the history. And I hope it does the same thing for uh, people who play it. There are some great books, great podcasts, and great TV series on this subject. So if anybody's interested, just go out there. There's um, do it because the story, this story, is not being spoken about much, and it's a story that deserves to be told. And this does it. This at least gets people a little bit interested in it. So yeah, which is a good thing. Yeah. All right. I think that does it for our episode. Alina, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Amazing. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this episode of History Respawn, please check us out online at www.historyrespawn.com. And if you enjoy our work and want to support us, please visit our page on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash history respawn. Until next time, goodbye.